We've been able to pray together already in this meeting, but I want to share with you all the thoughts that God has given in his word regarding the third person. Now, third person is a term that you can learn from many Trinitarians around the world. It's something that they call the Holy Spirit. It's the third person of the Godhead. And person is generally understood as a being, right? So what they're really saying, unfortunately, is that it's a being that is a spirit without a body. Nobody has really ever seen the Holy Spirit in a body, except you could say at the baptism, Jesus was able to see the Holy Spirit as a dove. But then you go to Romans chapter one and you learn that, you know, they became fools and they changed the image of the incorruptible God into things like for legged creatures and birds. So we don't want to make the God a bird, right? So we're not going to do that. We think that that is an illustration of the meekness and gentleness of Christ. It was actually the word of God, which is spirit that was sent from heaven to the sun. That's why when God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, that spirit, the word of God came down like a dove. Okay. It's, it's the, Jesus even said himself, be um, wise as a serpent, but harmless as a dove, right? So this idea of God, the Holy Spirit being a bird is, I think, a far stretch. And if anybody is saying that, I think they really need to check themselves because the Bible is teaching that to be foolishness. Okay, that's in Romans chapter one. Anyways, this idea of the third person, we don't generally know a person to be a spirit only without a body except when you're thinking through this concept of the Trinitarian ideologies. And so what does this mean? What could it mean? I think the Bible gives us some pretty clear evidence that third person could be understood differently. Now, if you're a student of Ellen White, you also know that she says that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. Um, uh, so you're wondering like, why, how, what is this? Well, she actually says that the Spirit is in all the fullness of the Godhead as well. So what does that mean? And we'll try to understand a little bit more as we continue on with this study. But my thoughts that uh, we're going to share together are taken for the most part from the Word. I will go into a little bit of Ellen White, but we're going to try to see third person in the Bible. What does this mean? So now we're going to try to understand this concept of third person. This third person concept can be found as you study the concept of son of man. If you just put in quotes, S-O-N of man, then you're going to find in Matthew 8, there's one time, in 9, there's one time, in 10, there's one time, 11, there's one time, and 12, there's three times it's used. But there's actually 88 times that the Bible refers to this concept of son of man in the New Testament, 88 different times. We're not going to look at all of them, though the notes will include them. You can find the notes in the description of this video when it's published. And you'll be able to see that uh, all through the New Testament, most every single time, this idea of third person is, I'm sorry, son of man is used. It is most often used by Christ when he's speaking of himself. Okay, so now we're going to go back and try to understand what this means. As we see in Matthew 8, verse 20, Jesus said unto him, now this is supposed to be in red letters, but I didn't put it in red letters because sometimes that's hard to see on a screen or a TV. So I just chose to leave it in black. The foxes have holes. By the way, Jesus is speaking to one of the scribes here. The foxes have holes. The birds of the air have nests, but the son of man hath not where to lay his head. Now, who is this son of man that Jesus is speaking of? This is Jesus Christ speaking of himself, right? Jesus is speaking of himself as the son of man. So when we're asking the question, what is this son of man? He, it's actually Jesus speaking of himself in what's called the third person. Now, third person, let me try to explain this because I had to learn it myself. I had missed that day in high school and I just didn't pick that one up. But when I speak in first person, I'm speaking as I am now. I am speaking of myself in first person. Now, if I switch and I'm speaking in third person, Daniel Mesa is speaking in front of a camera. And there are people that are listening to him as he speaks the word of God. So this is the third person concept. I'm speaking of myself as myself. Okay. And that's where I'm able to use he and him or his and, you know, 
my own name, Daniel Mesa, or a phrase that people call me, Pastor Daniel, Pastor Mesa. And in this case, Jesus is saying, Son of Man. He's actually coined himself with that phrase, Son of Man. Now, you'll see that he uses the phrase for himself, Son of Man, much more than he does Son of God. And which is very interesting because he was and is the Son of God, but here on the earth he wanted to illustrate himself as the Son of Man in the third person. Now, wh why? Why would he do this? Part of this is that the only mediator between God and men is not the Son of God. It is, but it's not. According to the Bible, it's the man, Christ Jesus. You see, Jesus had to become a man in order to be the mediator between heaven and earth. Because if he wasn't somebody that was compatible with fallen humanity, then we wouldn't be able to have some ladder that would be able to ascend from the earth to heaven where we could be able to ascend with him. By faith, of course, because we are in heavenly places in Christ. So if he was incompatible with humanity, we wouldn't be able to in, like, even partake of his um, Son of Man or Son of God experience. You see, God cannot be tempted with evil. And so, as a result, the Son of God, which was divine as his Father, therefore he is God, because his Son is divine, he's our God, that is, when he came to this earth, he was somebody who was able to live in our flesh, in our Abrahamic flesh, in the seed of Abraham. He didn't come in the nature of angels. He came in the nature of man, the seed of Abraham. That's why Hebrews chapter 2 says, Christ was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, you see? Because as God, he wasn't able to surrender himself to death as we know it. So for death, he became a little lower than the angels. So we understand that God cannot die. But Jesus, not being God, but being the Son of God, was able to enter into this experience of flesh and then therefore die. Now... Jesus is using that human experience as this third person concept. He's referring to himself as a third person or in the third person, the grammatical third person. So now going back to this concept of um, Matthew chapter 8 verse 20, the son of man hath not where to lay his head. Now could he have said the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but I do not have a place to lay my head. Yes, he could have said that, but he didn't. So now the next chapter, chapter 9, verse 6, this is Jesus speaking again, that you may know that I, now he didn't say first person, he said third person, that, I, that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, then saith he to the sick of the palsy, arise, take up thy bed, and go into thine house. He could have said that you may know that God has given me power on earth to forgive sins. He didn't say that. That you may know that I have power on earth to forgive sins. He didn't say that. That you may know that the Son of Man. So this person that Jesus is speaking of is himself. And this is the third person of Christ. This is literally the third person of divinity. Because Jesus Christ was divinity clothed with humanity. So this Son of Man is the divinity of Christ. It is the third person of Christ, who Christ, of course, is because he's uh, brought forth from the Father, he is of the Godhead. So this is the third person of the Godhead. The Son of Man phrase is it. Okay. Now, going to chapter 10, verse 23. When they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another, Jesus said. For verily I say unto you, you shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till I become, or till, third person, the Son of Man become. Jesus is speaking again in the third person, the grammatical third person. And so what's happening here is we are actually experiencing the blessings that um, God has given to his son to live on this earth in a way that will be victorious over sin. And that experience, his own fleshly human experience, which was divinity clothed with humanity, he was referring to in the third person. So who is the third person of the Godhead? It is the Spirit of Christ. It is the life of Christ on this earth when he was a human. He's no longer a human as he was. So what do we do? We look backwards to his life on earth, and we want to, by faith, experience that life in us. That's the third person that I want in my experience. I want Christ's life, his own experience that he was referring to in the third person, 
I want that to be what gives me the same power that God gave to him. Because God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, right? Well, Jesus said it in John 17, verse 22 and 23, where he said, Thou in me, Jesus was speaking to his Father, and I in them. He didn't say, you, Father, are going to be in them, and then I will be in them too. Well, that's how the Father and the Son, according to John 14, 23, that's how the Father and the Son make their abode with us, because really it was God in Christ reconciling the world to himself, you see? And so this concept of, you know, having divinity within us, that is only by faith in the life of this third person, the Son of Man. This biblical concept of the third person becomes really clear when you start seeing in the Bible this concept or this phrase, Son of Man, when you put it in quotes. Son of Man is Jesus Christ on the earth, victorious over sin, and the Bible says in Galatians 4, which we'll read later in verse 6, Because you are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, which is your mind, crying, Abba, Father. And so this idea of what is this third person that is filling us as humans, it is the spirit of his son into our hearts. And the spirit of his son was Christ speaking of himself. Christ was speaking in the grammatical third person. Okay, now, going back over here, I want to be able to look again at what the Bible is saying. Now, the Son of Man is going to be coming, and he's referring to himself in the grammatical third person. Now, let's see how... We continue on in chapter 11, verse 19. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they said, Well, behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of her children. Now, what Jesus is doing is he's speaking of himself in the grammatical third person here, but he also refers to himself as wisdom here. Wisdom himself, which, according to Proverbs 8, verses 22 through 30, speaks of wisdom, which you could say, no, that's not him because that's that's uh, female, right? Well, sure, it's female, but Jesus also, when he speaks of himself in Matthew chapter 23, and he says, I would have gathered you like a hen gathers her chicks under her wing, but you would not. Jesus is using a female illustration of himself, okay? So don't think that it's wrong in the Old Testament in Proverbs chapter 8 if he does it also himself, personally in the New Testament of Matthew chapter 23. So this concept of the idea that, no, it couldn't be Jesus because it's female, that is just a stretch of trying to get away from what the Bible is actually teaching. So Proverbs 8, 22 through 30, talks about Christ being brought forth from the Father, which is wisdom. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24 and 30 says that Jesus has been made unto us wisdom by his Father. It's impossible to get around it. Jesus is wisdom. And so even right here, as we're looking at Matthew chapter 11, verse 19, he's referring to himself as wisdom, which is justified of the disciples, which is his children or her children. And so this concept of Jesus using the third person here and also referring to himself as wisdom is really powerful. So this verse, Matthew eleven nineteen, is one that you're going to want to remember because it's pretty thick. You can really get down deep into that verse. But So we're going to go and try to understand a little bit more of what's being said here in chapter 12 now, as we switch over to Matthew 12, verse 8. The Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. How could the Son of Man be Lord of the Sabbath day? Well, this person, Jesus Christ, who is divinity that took on flesh, he is the Lord, the one that actually gave us the Sabbath day. And the reason why that's true is because what we see is that the Sabbath day was that which God the Father created through his Son on the days of creation in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And so this Son of Man, Jesus Christ, is actually Lord of the Sabbath. Well, the only way you're going to be able to keep the seventh-day Sabbath holy, the only way that you can do anything holy, is through this third person. Jesus Christ living in you, right? And he does that by his spirit. He doesn't leave heaven and actually jump into your body every time you pray. But what he does is by your by his spirit, which by the way is also found in his word, the word is spirit and life. That is how the Lord is able to fill us, if you will, that our minds may be renewed by the uh, renewing of our minds, how, something like that. And it's Romans chapter 12. But the Son of Man is going to be uh, the one that enables us to keep the Sabbath day holy. 
and that's the third person of the Godhead, right, as we talked about earlier. Another one here in Matthew chapter 12, verse 32, and then there's one after this also. Whosoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, this is Jesus Christ in the flesh, if you will, it shall be forgiven him, because even Jesus said on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Okay, so, yeah, the one that looks like everybody else, the Son of Man, you could, like, speak a word against him, but that'll be forgiven you. But whosoever speaks against the Holy Ghost, which is the divinity in the Son of Man, the Spirit in the Son of Man, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now, so, what does this mean? Okay, you could break this verse apart by saying this is the fleshly experience of Christ that he's referring to, and this is the divine experience of Christ that you're referring to. I think that's fair. You could do that. But I want to show you now something from Patriarchs and Prophets that I think will be helpful. But with this group, like, listen, we have shared a lot together. We've been able to understand a lot of beautiful concepts about how the Father gives everything to his Son, and his Son commands the angels to minister going up and down on that ladder according to uh, Genesis 28, verses 11 through 13, if you don't know about it. And then this same concept is in Revelation 1, verse 1. You can see it there. The angels bring it to the prophets, and the prophets bring it to us. We bring it to others, and we're part of this system called the spirit of prophecy, right? So you have this beautiful concept of the, uh, the spirit of God ministering to us in a way that is from the Father, through the Son, through the angels, and through the prophets. We know that that's how God ministers to us in most ways that you see this being done in the Bible, right? The prophets got the word of God through this channel, this order of service that God has set up. We're going to see that same concept now in this book called Patriarchs and Prophets. It's on page 404.4, and it says, These words were spoken by our Savior, which are the words that we just read in chapter 12, when the gracious works, which are miracles, which he had performed through the power of God, were attributed by the Jews to Beelzebub. You see, Christ had just cast out one of the demons, which was Beelzebub, okay, one of his servants. And so what is what are we talking about? Well, remember that the Bible teaches in Acts chapter 2, verse 22, that all the works were done by God, right? And it was through Christ, and that even the Jews knew that. But let's remember also further that when you're reading in like, for example, Matthew chapter 8, you can see the uh, angels were the ministers of the gospel, right? So God working all the miracles through his uh, son was also done by the power of God through the ministration of angels, you see? And so what's being said here, right? Well, the Jews have said that you worked those miracles through an angel, Beelzebub. Well, that's the devil, of course. Well, no, because really God was working his miracles through his angels, not the Satan's angels. And so this is the same concept here. The Jews were applying the miracles to a false god and the way that the false god would do his miracles, like in Acts, uh, the book of Exodus, for example, working the miracles through the magicians. Now, it is through the agency of the Holy Spirit, which is full of the agents that are filled with the Holy Spirit, so the agency of the Holy Spirit are the agents that are full of the Holy Spirit, right? The agency of the Holy Spirit is, it's through this agency that God communicates with man. How does God communicate with man? Well, it's the angels ascending and descending upon that ladder, right? And those who deliberately reject this agency as satanic, something not biblical, have cut off the channel of communication between the soul and heaven. That is a very pointed verse, a uh, quote rather, especially when you understand the concept of God sending everything through his son, sending everything through the angels, sending everything through the prophets, and to us, as far as communication is concerned, right? And not everything goes to the prophets, because I'm not a prophet, and I believe God has spoken to me through his angels, but uh, you understand the general concept of what I'm saying, so forgive me if I've overspoken. Anyways, going here to the final time in Matthew 12 that it's used, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The Son of Man is the third person of Christ. It is the third person of the Godhead. Christ had the Godhead. He had divinity as he was human. But it was clothed with humanity. That's, it was a mysterious combination. And so we know this 
that Jesus Christ was actually the divine son of God with humanity. And together, somehow, there was a combination to where when he died, he was still that divine son of God. We didn't just have a human sacrifice. We had a divine sacrifice. And that's why this divine son of God took on humanity. And he was divine because he was the son of God. He wasn't divine because he had magic powers or anything like that, you see. So just being the son of God made him divine. We can be partakers of that divine nature, having escaped the corruptions that are in the world through lust. When we do that, we are actually part of the family of God. And that's how we are considered this part of the divine family, right? Now, Christ, of course, was not uh, the same as humanity because we're his by creation and redemption. But Christ was the father's by being begotten. There is a difference there, a major difference. So this idea of um, Jonah being compared to the Son of Man, there's a lot there. And I've talked about that before, so I'm not going to go into it in detail. But there, I mean, there's so much in Jonah that illustrates Jesus Christ. It, it's profound. And so this verse is really good. Now, I want to be able to um, refer to words that Christ did not speak, Okay. So the words that Christ did not speak in the Bible uh, when it's using the phrase Son of Man are many times actually referring to the Son of Man already, right? So you're going to see what I mean. This is Mark, and he's, he's just commenting here. This is not quoting Jesus, but Mark is commenting that Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and of the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. So what is Mark doing? Mark is quoting Jesus Christ referring to himself in the grammatical third person, okay? So it's really fascinating how Mark is referring to Jesus speaking of the grammatical third person. So when Jesus Christ was speaking, Mark remembered him speaking of himself as this third person, the Son of Man. And so what Jesus was doing is he's actually continuing to let people know that he was this third person of the Godhead. He was this son of man, the one that referred to himself as himself. And so when you go to Mark chapter 9, you'll realize that as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things that they had seen till the son of man were risen from the dead. And so Mark, again, is not quoting Jesus. He's referring to what he said. And so Mark, again, is referring to Jesus speaking of himself in the grammatical third person. So now Luke chapter 24, verse 7, this again is quoting Jesus, not, uh, not, not having Jesus speak, if you will. This would not be in red letters. But there, these are actually the uh, disciples that were coming down the road from Emmaus, right? And when Jesus came to the side of these men... These men said, well, come on, the Son of Man, he must be delivered in the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. So even these men that were on the road to Emmaus, they were referring to Jesus as he referred to himself in the grammatical third person. It was very common for Jesus to refer to himself this way. And so even after the crucifixion, they were referring to him in the third person. And you know what? I'll tell you, if I ever wanted power to live like Christ, I would want to go to Christ. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And it wasn't God the Spirit. It was God the Father that was in Christ. And so if God the Father is in Christ and Christ is in us, that's how the Father and the Son make their abode in us. And I'll tell you, if I want power to live a sinless life, I want Christ in me. I want the Son of Man in me, which is the third person of Christ. I want the Spirit of Christ sent into my heart, crying, or into my heart, crying, Abba, Father. Do you see how this works? This is the third person of the Godhead. And so now when we're looking at this concept in, in uh, John chapter 12, this was a good one, by the way, and you should remember it easily by saying John 1, 2, 3, 4. It's these people answered him, we have heard out of the law that Christ abides forever. You know, we thought that Jesus Christ had immortality. We thought that he was going to abide or live forever. And how do you say the Son of Man must be lifted up on a cross? That means he's going to die. 
Who is this son of man anyways? You see, so the people that were answering Christ, they were actually speaking directly to Christ, we thought Christ had immortality. Kind of like Trinitarians today, they think that Christ has immortality. No, Christ doesn't have immortality. Christ actually died. He yielded up his life. He laid down his own life. He was dead. He didn't always exist. There was a time on the cross and in the grave where he was actually dead. And he, his body existed, but not his life, right? We have heard out of the law that Christ abides forever. And how is it that you're saying the Son of Man, this third person, must be lifted up? Who is this third person anyways? And so you need to go for yourself and look and see what it was that Christ had answered to them. And try to figure out. Use your own time and your, use your own mind, praying that God will send His Spirit through the ministration of holy angels, to help educate you on what the Bible is teaching there. I think it's fascinating. So as we go now to the book of Acts, we're going to be able to see that the scripture is teaching us. They said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man is standing on the right hand of God. Now this is Stephen. Stephen has, you know, he's, he's about to be killed. And it's as a result of teaching the Son of Man being in the heavenly sanctuary is when he was attacked. Not just with words this time. They were going to stone him now. And so he saw the heavens opened where Christ was, which, by the way, is a vision when you see the heavens open. That's why when Jesus, and when he was baptized, saw the heavens opened. Very interesting. And the Son of Man, which is this grammatical third person that Jesus so often referred to, was standing on the right hand of God. Now, why was it the Son of Man? Why didn't Stephen say, I saw the Son of God standing there? Well, because the Son of Man was given to humanity. He wasn't Indian given, if you will, as, as sometimes when you're an Indian giver, you take back what you've given, according to when you're a child, right? You've used those phrases. Well, the Son of Man, he actually is still a human. You, he even said after his resurrection, touch my hands and my feet, notice my side. I have flesh and blood. And so the Son of Man is glorified human now, but the Son of Man was what was seen in heaven standing at the right hand of the Son of, or of, of the Father. And so going now to Hebrews chapter 2, when one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him? David, by the way, meant this as human. What is the human, like Adam in the Garden of Eden, that you are mindful of him? Or the Son of Man, same concept, that you visit him, like you visited Adam, or that you visited Abraham, or that you visited Jacob. And so this concept is really meant for the humans on this earth, but the Bible can apply it to the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, even in this context of Hebrews chapter 2. Because Hebrews chapter 2 is actually trying to like, equate um, Jesus Christ with humanity. He was trying to show that in chapter 1, Jesus Christ is more glorified than angels. In chapter 2, he's trying to show that Jesus Christ is more glorified than humanity. And so you can just go through the Hebrews and realize that Jesus is the one that's being lifted up above all of the sanctuary on earth, all of the priests on earth, all even Moses himself. And you're just going through and seeing that God is trying to lift up his son through the book of Hebrews and show that he has a better ministry than that which was in the Old Testament, the Levitical priesthood. He now has the order of Melchizedek, right? So going now back to Revelation 1, verse 13. In the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. Now, John had seen Jesus. John knew Jesus very well. And this Jesus who came back to John in vision here, he didn't look exactly the same as he did when he was on the earth. That's why Jesus, uh, John was able to say, one like unto the Son of Man. He was clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Now this garment down to the foot and the girdle, that actually is the uh, attire or garments of the regular priests. Okay, But Jesus is the high priest, and so he goes into the most holy place in chapter 11 of Revelation. And so I think he puts on a different garment, even from what he was wearing on here, when he goes into the most holy place. So, anyways, uh, he also wears different garments when he comes back uh, from being a high priest as a king. So he changes his garments into kingly garments. So, going now to Revelation 14. I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto 
the Son of Man. So again, he's saying, like unto the Son of Man. This doesn't look exactly like the Jesus I saw when he was on the earth, but he looked, he's like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown. Wait a minute, this is kingly. And so he's wearing now something different. This is when Jesus comes the second time, and in his hand a sharp sickle. So Jesus is actually wearing something different here when he comes the second time. But now let's try to pull this all together one more time and try to understand what's being said. Jesus is speaking in the third person. Who is he speaking of when he does that? He's speaking of himself in his human experience, which was victorious, filled with the spirit of his father. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. In John chapter 14, verse 10, he says, the works that I've done, I mean, this is the Father working in me. The works that I do, it's my Father. And so uh, believe on the very works' sake if you don't believe in me, which he said in the next verse, verse 12, or verse 11, rather. And so it was God in Christ working out his own righteousness, because we know according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, that God has made his Son to be sin for us, who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God the Father in his Son. So really, it's, it's about the righteousness of the Father demonstrated through the life of the Son. Now, the Son was giving us this third person, which was himself, as he was speaking of himself. And that's who I want in me. So now, that's why I'm going to ask the question in this study, who in you? And, well, who in you? What is it? Well, it's Christ in you, right? Well, how? Well, it's the Son of Man, the third person of the Godhead in you. So it's, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God the Father dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Okay, I believe that his is referring to the Father, but either way, it's none of Christ's is fine too. But what's being said, I think, is... If you, uh, you know how it goes in the book of um, Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and onwards, if you're walking after the flesh, then you're going to fulfill the lusts of the flesh. But if you're walking after the Spirit, you're going to fulfill the lusts of the Spirit, or the desires of the Spirit. By the way, that word lust is not evil, as even Christ lusted. I can show you that sometime. It's in the book of Luke, when he says, uh, with desire, I have desired to eat this with you, right? To, to have this communion service with you. That word is the same word, lust. It's coveting. It's lasciviousness. And so Christ was lusting for that which was good. He didn't lust for that which was evil, okay? And in fact, he was pushing away from that which was evil when he was saying in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will but thine be done. Because Christ knew that he didn't want to go through what his father wanted him to go through. He was tempted with going contrary to his father's will. He didn't want that. He didn't lust after that. In fact, he pushed against it. That's why he was sweating blood there in the Garden of Gethsemane. And that's the kind of experience I want. So the question is, who in you? It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. But it was God that was in Christ, and both of them, the Father and the Son, will make their abode with us. So it's really, there's not just two spirits that kind of fill you. It's one spirit. There's one spirit according to the Bible. Look, look at Ephesians chapter 4. How does that work? Here's how it works, as far as I understand. God the Father had a Holy Spirit. Okay, He brings forth His Son. His Son, by default, has the same Holy Spirit. That's one spirit. Now, there is the angels that are brought forth, and they have that same Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of the Father, which is now in the Son, and now in the Holy Angels. Well, there's another angel that comes up, his name is Lucifer, and he has this idea of him should be worshipped, instead of just this other Son of God that's worshipped. Why shouldn't I also be worshipped? And so what happens is, this idea of another Spirit comes up. There's only two Spirits in the universe. There's the Spirit of God, or the Spirit of Christ, and the Spirit of Antichrist. And the Spirit of Christ is the Spirit of God, because they have the same Holy Spirit. And there's only one evil spirit. And so all the angels and everybody that wants to follow Satan, they all partake of that one spirit. All of the uh, God, the Father, His Son, and the angels, and all those that want to follow the kingdom of heaven, they all have that one spirit. 
And so that's why there's one spirit. It's not that, you know, the Father's spirit and the Son's spirit both come and dwell in us. It's the one Holy Spirit that is in us. If we want to follow the Father's will and the Father's will only, like his Son on the earth, then we have that Son of Man, or third person, spirit or mind. We want to surrender to the Father. If we want to surrender to the Father, we have that one Holy Spirit. If we choose to listen to the voice of another, we have his evil spirit. You have one or the other. There's going to be the sheep or the goats. You're not going to have this like middle thing in, in somewhere in between. You're going to have either one spirit or the other. And so that's why we have this one spirit. And that's why I want this one spirit which was in Christ. So who in you? We're going to see that it is the Father and the Son in you because really it is the Son's experience as this third person, the Son of Man, that enables us to partake of that Spirit because now it's compatible with humanity. Chapter 8, verse 10, the next verse. If Christ be in you, which is by his Spirit, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Now remember, Jesus himself said, the words that I speak unto you, they are Spirit. They are life. Okay? So if Christ, who is the Word, be in you, then it is spirit and life because of righteousness, because of Christ's righteousness, which was actually the righteousness of his Father demonstrated through his life. Verse 11, But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus, so it's not Jesus raising up himself, it's the Spirit of his Father that raised up Jesus. If the Spirit of his Father, the, the Jesus' Father, that raised him from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also give life to your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. So again, there's only one spirit. It's not that everybody has a spirit that fills everybody else that wants to follow, like, you know, their, their will or their mind. Now, so here's the thought. I'm not going to have the spirit of my angel in me, okay? I'm going to have the spirit that the angel submits to to be in me as well, because I'm submitting to that same spirit. That is the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of the Father, ultimately. So it's not like angels fill me. It's not angels that dwell in me. It's not evil angels that dwell in me. They have that spirit that they want you to have, and they have that spirit that they want you to have as well. So the holy angels want you to have God's Holy Spirit. The evil angels want you to have the Father of Lies, Holy Spirit. Or, sorry, evil spirit, my bad. So this is really the concept of how you have this third person within you. It's the Spirit of God. It's the same mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now going to this next verse, which this was uh, Romans 8, verses 9 through 11. We're going to see in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I, yet, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. How? By his mind, his spirit, his life. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the, what does it say here? Not Son of Man, interestingly. The faith of the Son of God. This is one of the few times that the term Son of God is, is used um, in this way in the Bible. Who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, the, the Son not only gave himself for us in his flesh, but he also gave himself for us in spirit. And that's why I guess you could say son of God here. And so when there was pity for the race and the father and the son decided that they would give the son to the race, they also decided to give the spirit to the race, the spirit of his son. And that's why this is not that difficult to, cons to understand that quote where it says that the father, son, and the Holy Spirit decided to give themselves for the race. Well, of course, because the father gave himself in his son, and the Father gave his Spirit through his Son as well. And that's why it's, you know, praise Father for his Son and for the Spirit. For the Holy Ghost, if you will. You've, you've heard that, that song before. Anyways, I'm going to read this one again. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. How? By his Spirit. And the life which I now live by the flesh, or in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, Galatians 4, verses 4 through 6, I've talked about before already, but now we're going to read it. When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them which were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions of sons. And because you are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your minds or hearts, crying, Abba, Father. 
So God sent forth his Son. God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son. These phrases prove to us that God only sent his Son. God didn't send his Son, and then God the Holy Spirit. God sent his Son, and then the Spirit of his Son. And it goes into your minds, or your hearts, because you are adopted into the family. You are adopted into the family of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Angels. And that Spirit of his Son will cry to his Father. See, because God only has one Son, and the Spirit of his Son says, Abba, Father. And that's how you're part of the family. This is a beautiful, beautiful section of the Bible. Now, Ephesians 3, verse 17 and 8, uh, through 19, rather, says, It is that Christ may dwell in your mind, your heart, how? By leaving heaven and filling you somehow? Well, no. Christ may dwell in your hearts, how? By faith. And it is by faith that Christ dwells in your hearts or minds, that you may be rooted and grounded in love. You may be able to comprehend with all saints, not just yourself, but with all saints, what is the breadth, length, and depth, and height. And you will be able to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. So you can know something that passes knowledge? Oh yeah. You can know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. That you, me, yes, me, you, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. How? Well, there is such thing as the third person of the Godhead, and this spirit that Christ was able to yield over to us, because he pleaded for his Father to give us the Spirit. And so what happened? God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into our hearts. And that's what the, the entire John chapter 14, 15, 16 is all about. And chapter 17, when Christ was praying, I will pray my Father, and he will send you another comforter. What comforter did the Father send? He sent forth the Spirit of his Son. So when we partake of Christ in us by faith, when he is in our minds by faith, we are then able to be partakers of the fullness of God. Like, wow, the fullness of God? I thought in Christ was the fullness of God. Like Colossians 1 verse 19 says that it pleased the Father that in his Son was all the fullness of God. Right. And so all the fullness is in Christ because it pleased the Father. But the Bible says that all the fullness can be in us too. How? How? By having Christ in our minds by faith. Now, wait a minute. If we're going to have Christ in our minds by faith, what does that mean? Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Okay, so faith. What is faith? Well, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? The Word of God. Because Jesus said the words are spirit. The words are life. Whose spirit? Whose life? The Father's Spirit, the Father's life, who the Father gave to His Son. The Father gave His life to His Son. You can read about that in John chapter 5, verse 26. So faith comes by hearing, and hearing not just by reading what faith is in the dictionary, but rather hearing the Word of God. The Word of God will give us the faith that, in the previous verse, will enable us to have Christ dwelling in us, right? The Word comes by faith, or faith rather comes by the Word, and this is how Christ dwells in our hearts, by that faith, which is the word of God, so that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Those are amazing, amazing verses. And so then we need to understand this verse, memorize it, understand it, teach it, and be blessed by it. By the way, Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 17 are really profound. It teaches that we can have Christ in us by his word. And that's what it's saying here too. So it's profound. Colossians 1, 26 through 27 it's the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations. But now this mystery is made manifest to his saints, those that are willing to be separated from sin and be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery, among the Gentiles. So the Gentiles are supposed to understand the concept of Christ in you, the mystery, right? 
So this mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This mystery is now made manifest. God would make known this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, not the third God of this Trinity concept. It is the Spirit of Christ in you that comes through His Word, and that's how you have the fullness of God in you. You are a partaker of all the blessings. Colossians 3.16 Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So here, this, this beautiful verse that talks about the word of Christ dwelling in you. Well, how do you have Christ in you? It's by faith. Where does the faith come from? From the word. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. By the way, just read 2 John as well. 2 John is really potent in this concept. So then you go to John 6, 63, which I referred to before. It's the spirit that quickens or gives life. How does this spirit give life? Well, the spirit is the words. The words are spirit and life. It's the words that give life. These words are spirit. These words are life. This verse is my favorite in all the Bible. This verse is so profound. I love it. I pray that God will help me to actually live this verse, that I will have a quickened life, that the words of God will be in me, spirit and life, that I will be able to exemplify the, the life of Christ in its fullness to those that I live with, I teach, I interact with, I share with, etc., 1 John 1, verse 3, that which we have seen and have declared unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us. Okay, we want a fellowship with you. What does that mean? Truly, our fellowship was with the Father and with his Son, Christ Jesus. Well, how is that? Through the Word we've just read about, right? Christ in you, and it's the Father and the Son in you, like John 14, 23 says, because God was in Christ, and Christ is in us. And so we have this fullness of God that is dwelling in us by faith, which is, of course, from the Word. Now, these are thoughts from Ellen White. We've talked about the Bible so far, and the Bible is very clear, I believe, on this concept of third person. Let's see what Ellen White says about it. Christ dwelling in our hearts by faith means, this is what it means. So if you want the meaning of Christ dwelling in our hearts, this is what it is. The contemplation of Christ. Wait a minute, that's done in your mind, right? Beholding Christ, well, we can't see him now. He even said to Philip, I'm sorry, Thomas, blessed are those who see me. Yes, true, but blessed even greater than that, those that do not see me and still believe. So we are beholding in our minds Christ. We are cherishing in our minds the dear Savior as our very best and honored friend, so that we would not in any action grieve and offend his Holy Spirit, which of course is the third person that we've been talking about this entire time. We won't grieve and offend him. And you just got to search this one by actually looking up the words, because you'll never find it by typing that in right there. So just search the words on that one. Anyways, here in, um, this is pamphlet 28. Those who do the words of Christ will perfect a Christian character because, this is why they will do the words of Christ and perfect a Christian character. Because... Christ's will, his purpose, his mind, his desires, his thrust in life, is their will, their purpose, their desire, their, their thrust in life. Thus, this is how Christ is formed within the hope of glory. So this is how it is. Christ's mind is their mind, you see? And then finally, if we repent of our transgression and receive Christ as the life giver, our personal Savior we become one with him, and our will is brought into harmony with the divine will, which is the third person of the Godhead, the third person of Christ. So this third person concept, as we've read about so far, is, I believe, Jesus Christ living in us. And the way that he would do that is through the word. He has given us his spirit and his life in such a way that we will be able to partake of him in the fullness of God. That doesn't mean you should worship me. I am not divine if I have the divine nature. I am a partaker of that which should be honored and glorified, which is the Father and his Son. The Father and his Son alone are to receive glory and honor. And so when we do that, and you can see that in Revelation chapter 5. So when we partake of the word of God, 
when we are actually living by faith in Christ, what we are living by faith with is the third person of the Godhead, the third person of Jesus Christ, the Son of Man experience that he lived on this earth victorious over sin. And so I want that in me. I want the third person life experience of Jesus Christ in me. I want to be the Son of Man on earth still. I want to be able to be a vessel for him to live out his life in me so that I will never, ever, ever, by choice, fall into listening to another voice again. I don't want to. I don't love it. I don't care for it. I don't want to be on Satan's term even one more step. I want to live for God. And the way we can do this is by the Spirit of Christ in us, not the Spirit of somebody else. So I want to pray for that. I want to ask for God to continue to bless and lead me in this endeavor. And I want you to do the same thing. So would you please pray with me, asking for God to fulfill his life within us. Lord of heaven, I want to thank you for giving us this time. And I do pray that you'd bless us, that as the song goes, that you would live out thy life within me, O Jesus, King of Kings. If the Son of Man experience could be mine, I don't think... I would ever have to fall again, because your son never fell a single time. But if I choose the voice of another, I know that I will fall. I pray that you'd help me to be strong, courageous, diligent, willing to surrender everything that I want for the sake of your glory, just as your son demonstrated when he was on the earth, when he said, not my will, but thine be done. Help that to be our daily experience. And as we partake of this third person in our life, the third person of the Godhead, we pray that it would be that we are victorious as the Son, your Son, was victorious. Thank you for this and glorify yourself. We pray in us, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.